Raju, Gulati, uh, breaking, entering. How to escape staying jail? I think also very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just want to say once again what a privilege it is to have been at this meeting again. To congratulate Tejas Patel for assembling such an amazing bunch of cases. Every year, what a bunch of cases. But I think most importantly, for maintaining the dedicated and hardworking Apex team who really have made this such a fantastic educational experience. Now, to this talk, I want to apologize uh, for the uh, vague and maybe mysterious title and cut to what we're going to talk about, which is the problem of stent protrusion, which is osteoprotrusion protrusion is a humbling experience. It, if it hasn't happened to you, it will. And it's almost never a problem on that day. The problem happens six months, 12 months, years later, when you or your partner has to deal with that in the middle of the night and the patient comes back with a new lesion. And here's just one such example, a patient who had a five millimeter stent to an osteal lesion of a cabral graft to a left main. It had gone great, but they came back with aggressive resinosis and angina six months later. And you can see there that the stent is protruding. So an attempt at intervention, if you look closely at where the guiding catheter is, the guiding catheter has deformed that protruding stent. It is now almost completely flipped over on its head over here. So there is no way that guiding catheter is going to engage that stent lumen. So you know the only way of dealing with this is to advance a wire through the side struts, and that's what was done, through the side struts into the cabral graft. And that lesion was dilated through the struts, like you would do for a, a side branch lesion, ballooned and stented. And I would say an acceptable but not a satisfying result. I suspect you've all been there having to work through the side of protruding stents. So that's the result, and the patient so far has done okay. Now, a few days after that case, we had another case referred to us. This was uh, what had happened at the referring institution, a high-grade osteal lesion you'll see there. Um, it was pre-dilated, and I pointed out the root calcium here because that's a good marker in this particular case for the osteum. I pointed it out because the operator maybe didn't realize that this stent was well outside where it should have been. Here is where the osteum is, and it was deployed badly. Not only was it deployed way out, but they lost wire access with a protruding stent, lost guide access, and there was plaque shift. So now the stent terminates here, and there's a critical stenosis just in the outflow of the stent. So the patient was referred to, as you see, had attempted to, to engage, and the stent was deformed even more by the guide interacting with us. So we elected to withdraw that stent or explant it. This is a tri-lobe uh, end-snare stent and a 7 French JR4 guiding catheter very easily engages with the stent. And here's the stent extraction here. I'm just going to let this play. So this is a 7 French guide from a femoral 70, 7 French 45 sheath, JR4 guide, extracting this five-day-old stent. Came out there, popped out easily. And here's the extracted stent. And after that, it was very easy to fully engage the osteum to adequately prepare the lesion. You see Ivor shows some disruption of the osteum from the stent extraction and a great final result. So this was a straightforward, complete extraction of a five-day-old stent that enabled downstream PCI. Now, a few weeks later, we're faced with this late-night case. This patient, who uh, um, a few days earlier had had uh, an angiogram showing aggressive restenosis of the osteum of a right coronary artery. With hindsight, that osteum had been underprepared before stent placement, under expansion, under preparation, and restenosis. He had a disease in the uh, left coronary artery too, so he underwent coronary artery bypass grafting. But during the operation, the surgeons were unable to graft the distal right coronary artery. They said the disease was diffuse. He had ventricular fibrillation in the operation and received internal cardiac massage. An inferior STEMI was diagnosed, and he was rushed to the cath lab at us late at night with an open chest. And you see here the drains. But look at what's happened to the stents. There is now marked protrusion from the internal cardiac massage. The stent is now hanging into the aorta. So one option, and you also see now that the vessel is completely occluded, causing the inferior STEMI. So here's the scenario. We have this stent that had failed, right? It had reached a nose a few months later. We have a bypass that has failed, and we now have an acute occlusion with an MI. We could go through the side of the stent struts and re-stent, but the chances are that is going to reach the nose yet again because of an under-prepped lesion at baseline. Better still, we thought, was to remove this 10-month-old stent, free up that osteum for better preparation, and then re-stent. So that's what we did in this case. 
you see the stent being gathered with the same technique that the trilobe and snare, uh, stent extraction, easy to engage the guide with the lumen. Um, you see here the balloon dilation, the balloon burst, probably because of a spike of stent metal, but a good final result over here after lithotripsy to the uncaged, newly freed up osteum with a good final result and the patient has done well. So this, in this case, the intentional stent extraction allowed unjailing of an underprepared osteum, better lesion preparation, and I hope this will result in improved durability. So two cases there. We've since done several more. Here are the seven cases that we've done, and there are a few observations in the last just over a year. Three observations I want to highlight. First, the only two stents that came out in their entirety were these fresh stents, a five-day and a zero-day. Everything else between 10-month-old stent and nine years came out as a partial. So even at 10 months, this stent is embedded into the vessel. The second observation is the tissue came along with the stent. Look at the tissue here, the re tissue. Look at that thick amount of tissue in this protruding osteal stent. The third observation is that these are not clean breaks. You see these spikes as a stent disconnects from what is left behind. In every case here, you see this spike of metal. This is a very crude model that we put together. There's a snare inside this guiding catheter. Here's a protruding stent from what we call the coronary artery. And you see how the stent disconnects. Now the stent is being pulled with a snare. The whole apparatus, and you see this elongation and snap. That shows the mechanism of disconnection of this uh, stent being uh, extracted. We can see that on the stent boost image here. We see a residual filament of stent here left behind after extraction. We see it six months on a CTA, a small filament over here that was actually connected to this extracted stent metal over here. So this is a, maybe a slight downside. I don't think a major downside, especially when you consider what, it, uh, what advantage this technique can give. This is a case of a, uh, an 80-year-old female with unstable angina who had a critical osteal restenosis in a protruding stent, and on top of that had a new mid-vessel occlusion. Two attempts to try and get uh, engaged into this vessel were unsuccessful. She was actually referred for retrograde PCI. We were going to work through the LAD to get to the right coronary artery. But in this case, we decided to extract the stent, very straightforward extraction, easy re-engagement, and uh, re-stenting from the mid-vessel back to the ostium with a great result, avoiding uh, retrograde PCI. I won't go through all the cases, but here's just in case you want to look at them. You see most of them were caused by misjudgment of the ostium by the operator, maybe migration, one cardiac massage. You see the follow-up, all are doing well uh, several months down the line. You see different stents, Synergy, Zions, and Onyx. To summarize, seven attempts at all successful, two complete stents, five were partial, five were in the right coronary artery, two were in vein grafts. You see the indications I've listed over there, no acute adverse complications, and all are currently asymptomatic without major event or target lesion failure. We've identified two downsides with this technique so far. The first downside is the risk of provoking acute instability. Here's a case of stable angina due to osteal restenosis here with a protruding stent. Unable to engage the guide, you see the guide is sat underneath this protruding stent. Procedure was abandoned, he was referred for extraction. Here was an extraction, you see the whole stent being lifted up and coming out. We used our standard setup of a seven French long sheath guide and the end snare. Successful partial extraction, but immediately after that, the patient had severe chest pain and there was ST elevation on the monitor. And you see how now we've converted a stable situation into a STEMI, acute occlusion. It was very straightforward to deal with this, but there is, you have to have your equipment ready, everything ready to go for this possibility uh, of acute uh, vessel closure. You see how now that this visual lesion, with I think only one strut here, no remaining stream intact stent struts and a, a very nice final result after uh, re-stenting. The second risk um, is of stent loss. Now this is a regret. This was an acute uh, protrusion of a malplaced uh, vein graft stent and it was the only time we used this technique with a six guide and a six short sheath. All the other procedures were done with a seven guide and a seven sheath and I wished we'd changed our setup but we didn't because what had happened was that the stent came into the guide partially 
a lot was protruding, it was extracted from the vein, but then the snare became disconnected from the stent and the snare came out. So we now have a stent that's hanging half in the guide, half out of the guide. And we tried a lot of techniques to take it out the body, but ultimately it got stripped in the femoral artery wall and needed a small vascular surgery operation to pull out of the body. So no major complication, um, but the lesson is to prefer a seven French long system. So my final remarks on this technique, I hope uh, you enjoyed sharing it with me and I hope I didn't scare you. I, I, I'm conscious of the fact that Tejas spent all of his time teaching us how to implant stents properly and, and I'm now saying, well, maybe we should take them out of the body. Um, here's one uh, uh, light microscopy of one of the explanted stent sections. You see the struts here, you see the nice tissue H&E staining. And just some comments here that this was an early experience. I don't want to encourage this and say it has to be done, but it is feasible with these cases I've shared with you. It unquestionably allows easy guide engagement, uncages lesions for better preparation, leaves less metal behind. And I'll say very kind of maybe cautiously is an option to consider. And I look forward to your comments. Thank you for your time. Uh, Rajiv, it was a very wonderful demonstration you know, Dr. Zufarov also wants to say something, but before that, may I ask you a question? I saw all the cases done by femoral root. Is that the standard approach for this type of cases, and why not radial? Yeah, no, it's a great, uh, I'm conscious of showing femoral cases here, which is probably not a good thing, <laughs> but the, the reason we went femoral, and also not just femoral, but a long sheath, was because of the risk of stripping the stem as we pull it out of the sheath. My thought was if you do that in the radial artery, it might be harder to deal with. In the femoral, okay, you have okay. a bigger room to deal so with. So which guide catheters you were using? Six, seven French or eight seven, French? All seven French. All seven yeah. French guide. Okay. Now, there is room, I think, to refine and make the technique yeah. better, but we have seven French long sheath, seven French guide. Yeah, I, I so, saw you using the uh, you know, snare, gooseneck snare all the time. Are you using bioptome or something like that to remove it? No, I, but I think it's a great thought. Uh, there's room to think about, because uh, a biopter might have an advantage of a better grip and a better clean break of the stent. <laughs> yeah. We use a trilobe snare because it's very easy to spin. It catches a protruding yeah, stent yeah, easily. You can yeah. pull it out. Yeah. Thank you. It was a wonderful talk.